God, once again, we come to the time where we break the bread of life. Lord, we ask today that you would fill us and feed us because we are hungry. We long for you. For God, we desperately need you. We don't simply need you to take up rest and send a part of our life, but God, we need you to take control of who we are. Today, as we continue studying about responding and recognizing your call, Father, we pray that you would speak to us through Jesus. May we leave this place today encouraged and changed, telling others about Christ. In his name we pray, amen. Take your copy of God's Word and go to Exodus, thir- Ex- Exodus chapter 3, verses 13 through 22. Exodus 3, verses 13 through 22. We're going to continue our message series entitled Ablaze, Recognizing and Responding to God's Call. Now, we've looked at how Moses stopped at the burning bush, and it wasn't until he stopped did God speak to him. And then we looked at last week and how Moses asked question, well, Lord, who am I that you would really want to use me? God, am I all that important? Well, this week, we look at something a little unique. A man named William Tuck walked on stage at an American Legion conference without being invited. You see, Mr. Tuck had lost... uh, lost sensibility with the present and the future. He didn't know who he was, and he asked the audience. He said, does anyone know who I am? Can anyone out there tell me who I am? Now, Moses dealt with this issue of who am I? But this week, he turns the question on its head, and he asks God, okay, you tell me this is who I am. Well, who are you? Take your copy of God's Word, and when you find your place in Exodus 3, would you stand as we honor the reading of that Word? Beginning in verse 13, Then Moses said to God, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am Who I am, or I am that I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God furthermore said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and ever, and this is my memorial name to all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has appeared to me, saying, I am indeed concerned about you and what has been done to you in Egypt. So I said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite to a land flowing with milk and honey. They will pay heed to what you say, and you with the elders of Israel will come to the king of Egypt, and you will say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us, so now please let us go a three days' journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not permit you to go except under compulsion. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my miracles which I shall do in the midst of it, and after that he will let you go. I will grant this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and it shall be that when you go you will not go empty-handed. But every woman shall ask of her neighbor and the woman who lives in her house articles of silver and articles of gold and clothing, and you will put them on your sons and daughters, thus you will plunder the Egyptians. May God honor and bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. God says to Moses, I am who or I am that I am. As we examine that very statement in God's response to Moses' question of, well, Lord, who are you? There are four things that I want us to see. I'm going to give you four statements this morning, but then I'm also going to give you four statements as what God expects of us as he calls us. The first statement is this. God is self-sufficient. God is self-sufficient. Now, the Bible says that 
Saul, later known as Paul, grew up trained under Gamaliel, the head scholar of the Jews in his day, and Paul knew about God. But the Bible says on the road to Damascus to persecute and kill Christians that in Acts chapter 9 verse 5, a bright light from heaven shone down. And all of a sudden, God, Paul hears a voice from heaven. And he says, that says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? His first question was, who are you, Lord? You see, Saul knew all about God, but he did not know God personally. Well, the question is answered also by Saul himself. Later, Paul in Colossians 1, 17, he says this about God. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. You see, he's not simply referring to God, but to Jesus, the one whom he met personally on that road. I want you to think about babies for a minute. How many of you all remember having babies at home? How many of you would still like babies at home? See, my wife is one of the only people who still wants a baby at home. I want you to pray for her in that regard. But babies are dependent, are they not? You know, a baby can't feed themselves. They can't clothe themselves. They can't provide shelter. They can't even hardly say goo goo ga ga without us almost precipitating that. But I want you to think about God. God is not like a baby, God is not dependent upon us for his survival and existence. You don't have to say to God, well, I don't believe you exist for God to exist because God says, I am that I am. Whether you want God to be or not is inconsequential because God is and will always be God. Understand this. God's motives are pure and he doesn't contradict his word in any way. You see in verse 23 of Exodus chapter 2, the Bible says that the sons of Israel sighed because of their bondage. And they cried out and they cried for help because of their bondage rose up to God. You understand the children of Israel, they finally said, look, we're not going to be able to escape our circumstances. Nothing we can do can get us out of the situation and predicament that we're in. Have you ever thought to yourself, you know, I will eventually be able to work this out. I can eventually do this if I just have the right time, if I have enough tools given to me. I want you to understand there's nothing that you and I can do unless God himself gives us the strength to do it. God is self-sufficient, but we, on the other hand, are called to dependency. Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. We need food. We need shelter. We need air. We need purpose, hope, meaning. God is the only one who can provide that. The psalmist says in Psalm 127, 1, Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. I've had people in life before tell me, well, pastor, I just, I'm not very good at praying and I'll never be good at praying. Well, let me share with you how you learn to be a good prayer warrior for Christ. You hit your knees and you pray. You say, well, I can't hit my knees. That's fine. Hit your rear end and pray. As I've often shared with you, the ancient Hebrews, when they went into the temple or synagogue, Jesus included, would have prayed just like this. How many of us say, oh, don't raise your hands in God's house? Man, Jesus did. All the time. But we need to pray. You say, well, what about about this word? What about the Bible? What does it mean to me? Well, let me encourage you to do something. Dust it off. Open it up. And allow the God of the word to speak to you through his word. There have been people who have said, well, Brother Brian, I can't, I just can't speak to anyone about Jesus. I don't know enough. I don't know what to say. Let me share with you this. Opening your mouth and saying something will do more for the kingdom of God than if you close your mouth and never say anything at all. God is telling the people here, you are dependent upon me. We can't do these things in our power because it's God who gives us the power and the strength through His Spirit to accomplish His will that He calls us to accomplish. 
Look, you can have all the materials and tools. You can go to True Value. You can go to Home Depot. You can go to Lowe's. You can say, man, I'm going to build a house. Buy all the materials. Put it in a barn. Put it in a storehouse. And say, look at all the materials. But if you don't do anything with the materials, what's going to happen? They're going to go bad. Man, I look at Christians and they are literally rotting. Because they're not being dependent upon the God of the universe to build in them a great work. And to build them up to be the people that he has called them to be. Moses was literally rotting away in Midian. Happy with complacency. Are you happy with complacency in your own life? I'm going to share something with you in this next point. You're going to say, oh, pastor, I don't like that. Well, man, you take it up with God. For second point, God is unchanging. He is unchanging. What the people needed, no, they couldn't accomplish by themselves. The Egyptians were the most powerful nation in all the world. The Egyptians had a plethora of gods. Even Pharaoh himself considered himself to be a god. And so the Egyptians literally in our day and age... Excuse me, the children of Israel, they were saying to God, God, we're like a peewee football team against an NFL team. We can't compete. We lack size. We lack brawn. We lack smarts. We just don't have it, Lord. We can't do this. And so the question is asked of God, not simply who are you, but look at verse 13. The question that is asked is literally God Can you do this? Are you able? Are you able to do the things that you say you're going to do? Have you ever questioned God? God, where were you on 9-11? God, where were you in that hospital room? God, where were you? When my loved one passed. God, where were you when my marriage broke apart? God, where were you when my boss came in and said, you're fired? God, where were you? You know, the Bible says in Isaiah 7, 14, that one of the names given to Jesus was Emmanuel. And Emmanuel means God with us. You don't know where God was? The Bible says that God was and is with us. That's where He is. Now, Hebrews 13.8 goes on to say in 13.8 that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is love. The psalmist says in Psalm 145.8 and 9 that the Lord is gracious and merciful. Slow to anger and great in loving kindness. He is good to all and His mercies are over all His works. Wherever you are as a Christian, you can see God at work because God is working. If you say, well, I don't see God at work anywhere, then what you need to do is pray and ask that God would remove the scales from your eyes because, friend, He's working all around you and me. And He's working in and through us as well. Now, I said I was going to say something to you that you may not like. Here it is. We are called to change and to be changed. We are called to change and be changed. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.15 that since Jesus died once for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again on their behalf. Now, Paul says, okay, I know this, but tell me something, Lord, in Romans 7, 19. For the good that I want to do, I don't do, but I practice the very evil that I don't want to do. Paul literally says this. He says, look, I struggle with right and I struggle with wrong. I want you to understand something. If you open up God's Word and you begin to allow God to speak to you, you're going to see this very quickly. Nowhere in God's Word does God call us to remain steadfast. Excuse me, remain stagnant. Nowhere does God say, hey, look, I like you exactly the way you are. Don't change. Don't do anything differently than you're doing right now. You don't need to go any different. You've arrived. You know, we as people, we don't like that word change, do we? 
Pastor, we're having too much change. God, I'm having too much change. And yet you understand that if we don't change, and we don't allow God to change us from within, that we very seldom will ever grow into the people that God is calling us to become. There were two men one day who were talking about their lunches. And one guy opened up his lunch pail and looked inside and said, I can't believe it, bologna again. He said, I've had bologna three straight days. And the guy who was sitting next to him said, well, why don't you ask your wife to give you a different sandwich? And the man said, well, to be honest with you, I'm not married. I fixed this sandwich myself. Nothing in your life will ever change unless you allow God to change your routine. Nothing will ever change in your life unless you allow God to change your routine. Now, I want to tell you something. I'm a man, and one of the things about being a man is that we have our routine. Don't mess with it. Don't knock it because it's good, right? We take our shower at this kind of day. We eat at this time of day. Boom, boom, boom. Ladies are a little bit more flexible you might say. And when they ask us to do something different, we don't like that. Well, spiritually speaking, each one of us has areas in our life that we don't want to change. We don't want to bend. We say, God, don't break that. That's what I like. You understand that doing the same thing in the same way, expecting different results is the definition of insanity? I think there are a lot of Christians who think, you know what, if we keep doing church the same way, eventually God's going to get it. Eventually he'll show up in a different way. Eventually people will come back. No. God is calling the church to change. But he himself is unchangeable. And that's the reason we're to change. To become more like Jesus. The third statement I'd like to share with you based on verse 14 is this. God is incomprehensible. What that phrase, I am that I am, literally means is this. I am being that which I am being or I will be that which I will be. You can't place God in a box. But his word is only a snippet of his awesome power. Did you know that? How cool is it that as we read the Word of God and as we become closer with God, God will almost always reveal more of who He is to us. We see in Exodus chapter 17, the Egyptians are, excuse me, the Israelites are fighting against the Amalekites. The Bible says that Moses holds up his arms with a staff in one hand and that as long as he kept his arms up, <coughs> the Israelites won the battle. At the end of that, when Israel was victorious, Moses builds an altar, and he calls that place, the Lord is my banner, Jehovah Nissi. God reveals himself to Moses and to the people in a unique way. In Psalm 23, David says, the Lord is my shepherd, Jehovah Ra. In Exodus 15, 26, the Israelites could not drink water because the waters, the Bible say, were, said were bitter. And so God allowed them to drink from a pure tree. And the Bible says that there he was given the name Jehovah Rapha, God is my healer. Even Exodus 48, Ezekiel 48, 35 speaks of a future hope. And so God is given the name Jehovah Shammah, God is there. I want you to recognize this, and there are many other names of God in the Bible. But where God is an almighty, holy, and righteous God... God is personable and he can be known. No, we can't understand him. No, we can't explain him. But the Bible says we may approach him through Jesus Christ. We are called to a relationship. We are called to a relationship. Paul says, In Ephesians 3.17, we are called so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I want you to understand this morning that God doesn't want to take up ownership in the basement of your life. 
He doesn't want to come and stay in your attic and get cobwebs. God doesn't even want to stay in the kitchen where once in a while you can cook him up a good meal and then it's over. God wants to have the best room in your house. He wants your heart. He wants your all. Does he have it? Does he have it? Of all the different religions in the world, do you know that God is the only God who can be known personally? Isn't that cool? He's incomprehensible, but he's personal. He cares about what's going on in my life. Every tear I shed, God cares about that. Every pain in my heart, God cares about that. Every time, some, time someone says something mean to me, God cares about that because He cares about me. Fourth, God is faithful. In verse 15, God says to Moses, Look, Moses, I have been faithful, I am faithful, and I will be faithful to you. I think oftentimes what happens is we forget what God has done. We forget what God has done. Situations that He's brought us through. Times that He has healed us, drawn Him closer to Himself. Brought about forgiveness, reconciliation. And so He says this to Moses. He says, Moses, you and the people will be able to, not, you will not be able to do this by your own power. And so He says in verse 17, but I will bring you up. Verse 20, I will stretch out my hand. Verse 21, I will grant this people favor. Why? Because you cannot. How many of you are familiar with the sun? Anyone? Well, for those of you who may not know, the sun is the planet that gives us light. Okay? So when you go out today, look at it, but don't stare too long. The sun provides light 24 hours a day, 365 a year. It's done so for the past year, for the past decade, for the past century, for the past millenniums. For as long as there has been light, when God said, let there be light, the sun has shone. And yet, if you ever realize that we have a time of day known as night, you see what happens is the earth rotates on an axis. And part of the time of day, we're focusing towards the sun. And other time, we're faced away from the sun. And so night comes about. I submit to you this morning that we don't have darkness in our lives because God is not shining. But we have darkness in our lives because we have turned away from God. The Bible says in James 1.17, there is no shifting shadow or variation with God. God is faithful. He's not gone anywhere in your life. Now, because God is faithful, He has called us to trust in Him. I'm reminded of the story of the Africa Impala. The Impala is an incredible creature that can jump over 10 feet and 30 feet in a distance. Yet, do you know these incredible creatures can be kept inside a fence of only 3 feet? This is true. You see, they do that... Because if the impala can't see where it's going to jump, and it doesn't know that its feet will fall safely, it will not jump at all. It will remain where it is. I believe that is exactly one of the reasons that so many of us struggle today. Because we're held in these small enclosures by Satan. And he says, no, you can't do anything good for God. Don't you remember this in your past? Don't you know about this in your present? Listen, God doesn't want you. Friend, God wants us to see with a faith that doesn't, it doesn't include our past. It doesn't include our present. But it knows this, that God is the Lord of all. He is in control. I close with this today. Pastor Tony Evans has shared a story about the Queen of England. The Queen of England lives in a beautiful mansion. People look up to her. She has great wealth. But there's one problem with Queen Elizabeth. She has no power. She cannot vote. She cannot veto. 
Her position is one simply of courtesy. And then Evans says this, what England has done to the queen, we have done to the king. We give him verbal recognition. We encase him in beautiful places called churches. People come once a week to pay homage to him. But when it comes to decision making, veto power and voting, we don't need him. Literally, we acknowledge his position without giving him the credit for power that accompanies it. Is that you today? I want to ask you truthfully. Who is God in your life? Who is God to you? Is he someone we sing about? Is he someone many years ago you said, well, you know, I'm going to put my faith in his son, but I'm not going to grow any. I'm not going to change. Is he someone that you've said, you know, I'm going to live for him no matter what? Is he someone that you've had to give up something in order to follow him? I want you to bow your heads this morning. Close your eyes. <clears throat> there will come a day when every one of us stands before God and gives an account of our lives. For some of you, that day may be approaching faster than it is for others. And on that day, as we stand before God, He's going to ask, Why should I let you into heaven? Some will say, well, Lord, I did good things. The Bible even says others will say, Lord, I, I spoke. I spoke for you. I gave money. I was a Christian. But the Bible says without a relationship with Jesus Christ and forgiveness of sin, that God will say, depart from me, for I never knew you. Do you know about God or do you know Jesus Christ personally? This morning you have the opportunity for God to change you. And friend, He wants to. The Bible says that God demonstrates His love for us in this while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. The question that Moses asked God, who are you? can be personal in your life today. You can leave this building and this place and say, listen, I want you to know something. God is everything to me. Jesus Christ is my Lord. He's my Savior. He's my all. Friend, do you know that right now? Do you know it for certain? If you were to die right now, you'd be in heaven. If you don't know that, you're questioning that. Today needs to be the day of your salvation. In just a moment, we're going to sing. And I want to ask you, if you would, if you're questioning, you're questioning who God is to you, would you come forward? I'd like to talk to you about what it means to be saved. It would be terrible if your child, your wife, your husband were at heaven's gates and you weren't there to join them. But you see, friend, the Bible says that every tear will be wiped from our eye. So at some point in time, in eternity, God will wipe our loved ones who are lost. He will wipe their memories out of our mind. Because we're not going to be burdened with them for eternity. Would you receive Jesus today? You may need to come to the altar and pray. To talk to the Lord about some important things in your life. You may need to go and pray for some others you know don't know Jesus personally. You may have been visiting Friendship Baptist Church and today God is calling you to unite with us and telling people about Christ and growing through faith with Him. Would you come? Whatever the Lord is leading you to do, you come and do that today. There may be someone here, as Miss Celeste said, that God is calling into ministry. He may be calling you into Christian counseling. He may be calling you to preach. He may be calling you to music ministry, youth ministry, children's ministry, senior adult ministry. God may be calling you to be a missionary. He may be calling you to be a scholar. God may be calling you to serve Him in a specific vocational ministry. Don't leave this place today without saying yes to Jesus and to His call.
Father, we thank you for the opportunity afforded to us now. May we be faithful and say, yes, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand as we honor the Lord and respond to his call?